All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 45, Psalm 37. And I, I thought we'd just pull back just for a second, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of a, as you're in the middle of this. I mean, here we are in Psalm 37. Like, this is, this is really one of my favorite psalms. Like, when I go through life, I feel like I'm referencing Psalm 37 in my heart, maybe just as much as like a Psalm, 30, uh, psalm 91 or maybe a Psalm 23, maybe a Psalm 1. But, you know, when you think about what we're after, we're always trying to see, Lord, where is the Messiah in this book. And so our, our phrase, Kevin, is what for the, for the book of Psalms? King of glory. What does, that, what does that mean, king of glory? He reigns over all the splendor. He reigns over everything. He reigns over everything. So here you have the presence of God, the glory of God coming down, right? Into man, into Jesus, if you can say it like that. But Jesus is carrying the glory of God as he's here on earth. And oh, by the way, he's, he's coming back. And I, I just think it's a cool picture. So at every book of the Bible, we are asking, Lord, where is the Messiah in all of this? And then over here, I just haven't referenced this much. And sometimes I get caught up and I, I just thought, oh, man, let's just slow down for a second. Mindy paints one uh, painting for each book of the Bible. Now, guys, when you look at this with the King of Glory, obviously, we're going to point out the crown here that Mindy's po uh, is, is painting here. But what else? What else stands out to you guys in this painting? For me, it's the, the clouds and the, be, the contrast from the left to the right. All right, what about you, Rich? Anything stand out? I think that's a great picture, Kevin. Um, the birds. Yeah, that's good. You know, we've been talking about, even the last couple of days, about why we should praise him, right? We should praise him, and I wrote these things down because he answers prayer. We praise him because he provides for our needs, just like the birds. We praise him because he's delivering us from troubles, and we praise him from protection from danger. Mindy actually wrote these five, or painted these five birds to symbolize praise. And so the songs and the worship of this collection, five is the number of grace. In fact, she said from Psalm 104, 12, on their banks, the birds of the air build their nests. Among the branches, they sing. I don't know, sometimes I think you can learn different ways from the Psalms and sometimes it's through emojis, sometimes it's through our talking and sometimes when you just don't slow down. And so I just, man, praise the Lord for Mindy's paintings. Praise the Lord for her. You know, I, I will say this, and we're gonna get into this later on, but each one of these scrolls represents uh, it could represent just the different books in, in the Psalms. Um, and so anyway, just a couple things that just simply wanted to point out because really what you look at Psalm 37, Psalm 37 is, it's a wisdom Psalm. Okay, it is, uh, it, it, the whole point of this message, I don't know why I'm pointing here, but the whole point of Psalm 37, you're really, it, you're, the, the, the writer is looking at, how do I put this? To maintain, as Nelson says, uh, patience in the midst of trouble. Okay, so here you have this, uh, this message. Now, how does this fit? This fits with the key message, even so, of God and Israel and their relationship. So if Israel can maintain patience amidst everything going around them, they'll begin to reveal how God wants to show himself in, in his covenant with them. Okay, now think about it this way. God owns the land, okay, that they're on. And if they obey him, crazy enough, they'll actually be allowed to live in the land. And so as the land goes crazy, can you trust God amidst all of this that he'll get you through it? It's a really cool picture. It's a powerful picture of God's covenant between Israel and himself. And in fact, there's times where, and I like what Wearsby says in this, he's going to chasten his own people. So if Israel then disobeys, right, the Lord, what happens? Well, he chastens them in the land. He brings invasion. He brings drought. He brings famine. But if they, and if they continue to rebel, what does he do? He takes them out of the land, which then, Kevin, where do they go to? Captivity. Captivity. So you have this crazy process of, as everything's going around, can you maintain patience and trust in the Lord that he'll get you through it? In other words, don't depend upon your flesh to get through these situations because that's when we get in trouble. Just think about a robber. Think about a thief. You know, when he's like, oh, no, I don't have money. Instead of trusting the Lord or getting a job or, you know, waiting for the Lord to provide, they, they go steal something. I know that sounds crazy, but he's saying, trust me in this process. And so in the first 11 verses, what you see here uh, from Nelson's, it says this, the Lord can be trusted. Uh, can you go to 1 Kings 2, Kevin? Because that's great. Because some theologians would say maybe this psalm was written maybe 
for handing Solomon, David handing Solomon the throne, and these are his written instructions on what to do. As the time approached for David to die, he instructed his son Solomon, verse 2. I'm going to go all the way to verse 3, though. It says, As for me, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong and be courageous like a man, and keep your obligation to the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, commands, ordinances, and decrees. This is written in the law of Moses so that you will have success in everything you do and wherever you turn. 1 Kings 2, 3 really sounds like Psalm 37. Again, it's hard to say yes or no, but I do like this mentality of a father writing to a son who's taking over the throne. If you stay in alignment with the commands, with the ordinances, right, and with all of the laws, if you keep in these commands, guess what? You're going to have success and favor wherever you go. Sounds like Joshua 1, doesn't it? Everywhere you put your feet, I will give this land to you. Oh, but by the way, you have to be sanctified and walk it out according to the word of God. So everything, it, it, it seems conditional, doesn't it, Kevin? Mm -hmm. And in some ways it is in the Old Testament. If my people do this, I will do this. If you don't, I will do this. And so what I want to show is what David is showing, may, maybe Solomon, is that the Lord can be trusted in this process. So in verse one, please be patient as you'll see success from the wicked. He says, don't be agitated by evildoers. Don't envy those who do wrong. You know what I love about this phrase? Do not fret. Don't fret. Don't freak out. In other words, don't allow things to get burned up, to get heated up. You need to cool down, as, a, as one commentator says, and just stay cool. Like, don't get worked up because you see the wicked actually prospering. So here's what I want to do when it says this, don't be agitated or do not fret. How would you guys say you fret? Or maybe you don't. Is there something that you would say, Kevin, causes you to fret more than other things? Uh, when I look at my budget and the numbers are upside down. Oh, yeah. Okay, so here, here's what you do when you start to think that you're going to start fretting. Or you see numbers upside down, okay? First of all, okay, call for patience. Like, bef like just, just... <laughs> Like, just be slow to, okay, hang on here. I'm calling upon the Lord for patience. And then in a weird way, but it's, it's really simple, ask the Lord for a renewed sense of dependence on the Lord. So ask the Lord for patience. Ask the Lord for a renewed sense of dependence on the Lord. And then what happens is that you get a new sense of pleasure in knowing him. So what do you do? You find all of your patience, all of your dependence upon him instead of the evildoers, instead of the, the situations. And then you're not even worrying about what they're doing wrong. For they wither, it says in verse two, they wither quickly like grass and they wilt like tender green plants. <laughs> I mean, these are people they're talking about. Like these are people, but they're evil, wicked people with their plans and they just, they just come and go. This would be great Texas grass right here. Like not Augustine grass. <laughs> it just won't last long. They're going to wilt like tender green plants. Trust, here it is in verse three, trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Wow, I love this. Here it is. You ready for this one? You know what this is? This is faith and works right here. That's what this is. We're not talking about salvation here. This is not the issue of salvation. They're saying when you trust in the Lord, and then what do you do? You do what is good. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Don't just trust in the Lord and then be lazy. He's saying, oh, and live out what you're trusting. And then when you do that, you'll dwell in the land and live securely. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about living out your trust. And then in verse four, you guys have heard uh, so many of these verses on bumper stickers, on posters, but in Psalm 37, 4, I use this all the time on the streets. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. What an awesome picture. Well, how can I pray for you? This is the question we ask on the streets. Well, how can I pray for you? Well, I don't, I don't really know. I'm good. Well, like, 
What would you say like is your heart's desire? Like what would you love and long to do? Well, I don't, I don't know. Like you hear this all the time. Or if they say, well, I'd like to be a millionaire, you know, or I'd like to, uh, you know, the classic guy wanted to have a marijuana farm in California. Whatever, whatever it is, is God going to give your heart's desire if it's not in alignment with his will? Well, no. And so for me, when you don't see your heart's desire come to fruition, hang in here, okay? My challenge would be, are you delighting in the Lord first? I'm not talking about the marijuana farm. <laughs> I'm not talking about winning the lottery. I'm not talking about those drastic things. I'm talking about, are you, Psalm 34, remember it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's this image to me. You are absorbing his everything. You're absorbing his presence, right? And then in his presence, he actually is the one that actually gives you your heart's desire. I don't know, Kevin, Rich, you want to comment at all in this, in your own life? Just thinking about Solomon's life, if this is David talking to, to Solomon, when he was walking with the Lord, he gave him what, wisdom, what he asked for. And as you delight in him, he then gives you the heart's desires. And so I, I don't want to miss Psalm 37, 4. So I just want to say this. Some of you right now are saying, you know, Kyle, I don't really, um, I don't really have a heart's desire. I would say this. I think he wants you to have one. I think he wants you to find your sweet spot. I think he wants you to walk out his purpose and plan in your life. I think he longs for that for every single person. Would you guys agree? I think he has a purpose for every single person. How do you find that? I would say delight in him. How do you delight in him? I'm going to make it super simple. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18, it says you rejoice in him, you give thanks, and you keep on praying. Like to me, that's a process of delighting in him. And in that, God says, good, Kyle, now that you're actually listening to me, I'm going to show you what your heart's desire. I'm going to actually give you what makes you tick. It's just a cool picture because look at this in verse five. He says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. This, this phrase commit, okay? I think it is one of the coolest uh, when you look at it in the Hebrew. It actually means this, to roll it over onto the Lord. So God, I'm gonna give you Everything that I'm thinking, I'm going to give it to you. And you do with it what you want. Trust in him and then he will respond and then he will act. Can you go to 1 Peter 5, 7 for me, please? Are you rolling everything over to the Lord? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care on him because he cares about you. Are you giving every little situation? And it, it means every situation. Because then in verse six, it says this, after he will act, he's going to make, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. And in verse seven, it says, be silent. Or also the Hebrew could be translated, be still. Be silent, be still before the Lord, and then wait expectantly for him. So what are we waiting for? It means you've committed everything over to him. So don't be agitated by one who prospers in his way. In other words, like maybe your, your thoughts are you're giving this to him, but somebody else is doing something that you wanted to do. Just don't worry about it if he's prospering by the man who carries out evil plans. I want you, and I like this, to rest and wait patiently, cease from worrying. I want you to give it to me. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. I was talking to my brother uh, yesterday on the phone, and we were just talking about some things that he's dealing with, things that I'm dealing with, and I said, you know, Shannon, you, you might not like this answer, but I think your answer is going to come in, in just being quiet before the Lord. Like, you don't need anything. No Bible, no journal, no pencil, no phone, no music. Just be silent and let him speak to you. And in verse eight, as you're quiet, refrain from anger. Don't give up and don't give up. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can actually only bring harm for evildoers will be destroyed. But those who put their hope in the Lord, amen, will inherit the land. 
Kevin, it, it seems to keep coming back to this land thing. I was gonna say it's kind of like verses one through three in eight and nine there. Let's, let's build this. It goes all the way to verse 11. A little while and the wicked person will be no more. Though you look for him, he will not be there. Now think about this context, you guys. If David is talking to Solomon about taking up the land, because what does Solomon do? More land, right? If that's the case and evildoers are taking the land, he is saying, if you put your hope in me, I'll give you the land. Don't worry about those evil guys. Don't worry about those guys getting more. In verse 11, he says, look, here's the perspective, Solomon. The humble will inherit the land and will enjoy abundant prosperity. Yeah, but I don't get that. I don't see that. What are you talking about? I see the Agagites. I see the Hittites. I see the Jebusites. I see all these people. They take their own land. And he says, man, if you relax, if you're humble yourself before me, you'll inherit the land. And oh, by the way, you're going to enjoy abundant prosperity Jesus even talked about this. Can you go to Matthew 5, 5? Jesus was actually confirming, this is a funny way to say this, the Old Testament importance. Because he's quoting, or Kevin, I know you always like to say who's quoting who, but Jesus is quoting Psalm 37. The gentle are blessed for they will inherit the earth. The meek are blessed for they will inherit the earth. In verse 11 of Psalm 37, the humble will inherit the land and they will inherit, yes, they will inherit the land. If we understand this, um, man, let's go here. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the land here, okay? Because uh, this is a big deal. I mean, if, if Solomon's coming into a situation, it's going to be easy to think, man, I got to do, 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 do. I got to take over. But if you're silent before me, I want you to understand when you come before in humility, I'm going to give you. In fact, I'm going to give you the security of, for future generations for this land of promise. I mean, in Genesis 12, does he not say, I'm going to give you the land? And it goes, you guys, to according to God's covenant. Lord said, Abram, in Genesis 12, 1, go out from your land, your relatives in your father's house, to the land I will show you. Kevin, at this point, he doesn't promise him, um, like, oh, by the way, take all your money. Like, he, he just says, go. I need you to go, and out of obedience, go, in verse 2. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And even you will be a blessing, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who treat you with content, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. But if you go back to verse 1, all of that is conditional until he goes. He has to go. You know what that means? It means ultimate trust. Do not fret. Do not get anxious. Because when you walk this thing out and believe in the covenant that I have with you, you're going to inherit the land. I actually think he's talking about land. I actually think he's talking about the country there. And he says, I'm going to give this to you. I like what Wearsby says in relation to this whole land thing, because I've been processing this and it says, for God has a great work for his righteous remnant to do in that land. Like the land, when you walk in humility and you trust God, you have to believe that, that they're going to be given the land. Rich, we have been to Israel many times. It's probably one of the most unique things what happened in 1948. Uh, they became a nation which implies they were given what? They were given their land back. They were given their land. It doesn't make any sense, you guys, except God has a bigger purpose. You ready for this? For that piece of land. If you trust me, if you don't get agitated, if you don't fret, if you call for patience, you're going to get a renewed sense of dependence. You're going to get a new sense of pleasure in knowing me. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you the land. Psalm 37 is a prophetic picture of what's to come. You will inherit the land. And here's what it is. All of this land, Rich, we know this, that when all of the people start coming back to inherit the land, right? <laughs> Ultimately, it's going to culminate to the coming of the Messiah. So Psalm 37 says you're going to inherit the land. You're going to enjoy abundant prosperity because eventually, eventually it's going to lead to the Messiah coming back to that land. You know, hey, that's a long timeline I just went to. But the wicked will be cut off. I don't know. I just think there's, some, there, there's something here. I just felt like the Lord just said, don't, don't miss this. Don't look past this. Like when you walk in meekness, when you walk in humility, you will be given the land that's before you. And I, I believe that this is going to be a year of miracles. And I believe God wants to give the land. I just needed to say that for me personally. The land is coming. 
when we walk in meekness. The land is preparation for the coming Messiah. The land is preparation for the return of the King. The King of glory is coming back. Do you trust me enough to believe that, though, he says? Solomon, listen to these words. If you keep going here, Kevin, in verse 12, the Lord can be trusted and the Lord understands your situation. Praise God. The wicked person schemes against the righteous and he gnashes his teeth at him. It's kind of, kind of common language. You kind of wonder if David was walking everywhere and everybody's just like, nyong, nyong, nyong. <laughs> Kevin, how would you do gnashing of the teeth? Mm -hmm. There he is. There's our buddy. That's the gnashing of the teeth emoji. Don't send that to anybody. And then in verse 13, because of the gnashing of the teeth, the Lord laughs at him. <laughs> Not him, him. Because he sees that the wicked, his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and they strung the bow to bring down the afflicted and needy and to slaughter those whose way is upright. Verse 15, their swords will enter their own hearts and their bows will be broken. In other words, the weapons are going to turn against themselves. The little that the righteous man has is better than the abundance of many wicked people. I love that line. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord supports the righteous. God will always provide. The Lord supports the righteous. The arms of the wicked are going to be broken, but God says, I'm, I'm here for you. I mean, just practically the feeding of the 5,000. I got you. The feeding of the 4,000. I've got you. What about the widow and the sons? Just go around collecting jars. I've got you. The Lord supports the righteous. And then it says in verse 18, Scripture continues on, the Lord watches over the blameless all of their days. In other words, God knows everything. That phrase watches over, it implies God knows. He understands like daily we need the bread. Nelson says it this way, God knows our circumstances and he provides for us. Nelson says God knows how long we will live and he'll sustain us till the end. This mentality the Lord watches over us implies also that God knows our days on the earth, our beginning of our days with him in eternity. So when it says God watches over the blameless, it actually means God knows everything and their inheritance will last forever. They will not be disgraced in times of adversity. They will be satisfied in days of hunger as my stomach growls. <laughs> But the wicked will perish. The Lord's en enemies, like the glory of the pastures, will fade away. They will fade away like whew, smoke. Crazy enough. The Lord understands your situation. The Lord can be trusted. The Lord understands your situation. And I like what Nelson closes this thing out with is, well, almost closes it out. The Lord blesses his people. And Kevin, we talked about this. It feels conditional. If you do this, I got your back. The wicked man borrows and does not repay, but the righteous one is gracious and giving. I love this one. I mean, there's such a contrast of possessions, right? The righteous man, he, he borrows and then he doesn't repay, but the, the, the righteous, he, he's giving it away because he realizes this is not his. He realizes that material things will pass away. In verse 22, it says, those who are blessed by him, here it is, will inherit the land. But those cursed by him will be destroyed. So please understand this. Trust me, he'll give you the land. A man's steps are established by the Lord. You guys have quoted this many times from people for praying. The man's steps are established by the Lord and he takes pleasure in his way. You, you know what that means for me? Psalm 37, 23 is a reality of Psalm 37, verse 4. Psalm 37, 4 says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of the heart. But then when you jump to the desires of the heart, they become your man's steps. They're established by the Lord and he takes pleasure in this. It's like this fold of like God gives this to you. He puts it on your heart. You start walking it out and God delights in that. It's an awesome picture. In other words, God orders our steps. When it says his, his, his steps are established, it could also mean he keeps you from stumbling. 
Verse 24, though he falls, he will not be overwhelmed. It's that God giving you the hand to get out of the pit. Even though you fall, you won't be overwhelmed. I got you because the Lord holds his hand. <laughs> it's that image of Job again, isn't it, you guys? There's the hand. I, I got you, Job. I got you. I know it feels like a lot, but I won't allow you to be overwhelmed. Even though you feel like you're falling, I've got your back. And David then writes, this is a cool picture. I've been young and, and now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging for bread. Remember that image I said I always sit down on the, on the stoop on a curb whenever I pray for provision and I always just see the Lord putting bread in my hand? Like it's funny, you'll never have to beg for it. God's just going to give it to you. He's always generous. The Lord is always lending and his children are a blessing. So turn away from evil, the scripture says. Do what is good and dwell there. Dwell there forever. Hang out there. It's that Psalm 24. You want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Good. You turn away from evil. You do what is good. You can dwell there forever. Like this is the mentality of clinging to the Lord. The Lord will bless those who cling to him. It says in 28 and 29, basically, if you love, if the Lord loves justice, he's not going to abandon you. You're kept safe forever, but the children of the, the wicked will, they, will be destroyed. And here it is in verse 29. Again, you guys, the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it permanently. You think he's trying to tell his son something? If you walk out righteously, if you trust God, if you depend upon God, don't let all of these things around you get in the way. I'm going to give you the land. And guess what? You can dwell in it permanently. The problem is, if this really is for Solomon, he forgot Psalm 37. What happened, Kevin? He took a wrong turn and split the land, split the land. And eventually they left the land because they didn't live like this. In verse 30, the mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. His tongue speaks what is just. The instruction of his God is in his heart. His steps do not falter. In other words, you hold on to the word of God. You hold on to this truth. And when you do, you will not have anything to worry about. Your steps won't falter. You don't have to worry about your next step. It says in verse 33, I'm sorry, in verse 32, the wicked one lies in wait for the righteous and seeks to kill him. But don't worry. This is how Nelson closes it out. As that guy is waiting to kill you, the Lord judges the wicked. You know what that ultimately means? God's got your back as you walk this thing out. Wait for the Lord in verse 34. He'll exalt you to inherit the land. Like this whole process, God is saying very clearly, you walk in my ways and I'll give you the land. Prophetically, I say, yes, Lord. May this land be a preparation for the return of the King of glory. There's a lot more here. Please dig into the word of God. But I'm telling you, when we walk this thing out, God is clearly preparing us for more. All for His glory. All right, guys, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.